Okay, because I keep getting asked about this one uh, pretty consistently, we are doing Purple Hearts. The Netflix sensation that is sweeping the nation, allegedly. So why not? Also, I, I figured I would uh, switch up the background. So let me know what you prefer. Do you prefer the uh, the fine dining set background or the uh, the kitchen food item wallpaper? L let me know down below. I added the Wolverine for decor. I figured that this would be a good movie to swap in because originally I was going to be covering the new After movie because I thought it was digitally releasing next week, but it's actually only theatrically releasing in the United States next week. I saw it because it's been out in Canada, uh, but I need full access to those clips so I can fully express to you the wonderment that is after ever happy. I'm just giddy waiting. So we swapped in this one. I know my pal Kenny JD covered this about a month ago, and I think Read with Cindy just did this as well. I'm pretty sure I saw that pop up. I haven't watched either of their videos yet because I want to maintain uh, my artistic integrity. <laughs> so make sure to check theirs out if you haven't already, but Purple Hearts is the latest in the slew of Netflix romance movies of different types and calibers and subcategories and genres. And today they have brought us a true tried and true fan fiction classic. This will feel right out of a Wattpad, enemies to lovers. Except by enemies, I mean people with fundamentally different political and social views. Basically the premise that we're running with is that he is a Marine and they need to get married to take advantage of some kind of benefit you get from being married, but they hate each other. But before we dive into that excitement, you should dive into the excitement of today's sponsor, Birch. Birch is a premium mattress in a box company making products that are stylish, comfortable, and made with non-toxic, organic, and natural materials that are all sustainably sourced. Meaning they're better for you and the environment, but most importantly, they are super comfortable. On top of great lumbar support, Birch mattresses are designed to have increased airflow to assist in breathability and cooling, which both contribute to a great night's sleep. They use hypoallergenic wool, which is both allergen and mildew resistant, which is great for someone like me who has a ton of issues with allergies. The wool is also sourced from New Zealand farms that are wool integrity NZ compliant, which means it's sustainably harvested. Sleep is one of the things that I value most in the world because it directly affects how well I function as a human being and enjoy my life. My last mattress always got too hot while I was sleeping, so I'd wake up in the middle of the night and then it had bad back support so I wouldn't wake up rested. With Birch, my sleeping temperature has felt a lot more regulated because of that breathability. And I don't wake up feeling sore because I wasn't just sinking deeper and deeper into the mattress overnight. They also have a variety of different accessories so you can customize your sleep experience to your liking. Now a mattress is obviously a big commitment. You spend a majority of your life sleeping so it's important to find the right fit for you. And that's why Birch offers a 100 night sleep trial as well as a 25 year warranty. If you don't love it, they pick it up from your house and you get a full refund, no hassle. So if you're like the rest of the world and like free stuff, each Birch mattress purchase comes with two of their Eco Rest pillows delivered right to your door. They're made with recycled plastic bottles and still manage to be so plush and cozy, it's amazing. And if you live in the United States, all this is delivered to your door for free. So if you're looking for a new mattress and wanna find out why I love my Birch so much, make sure to click the link in the description down below or head on over to birchliving.com slash Jedi to save $400 off your Birch mattress plus two free pillows. I can absolutely see why a lot of people love it and they think it's so cute. But as an enemies to lovers, it is really not the vibe. Like this man essentially says, oh, your mom's one of those illegals to her uh, and they get played off as a romantic couple from that point on. Yay, he doesn't think her family deserves rights. It's the kind of movie that would have felt right at home back in 2002 or 2003 when military deployment was an all time high. That was 10 years ago. Big fan of this quote from the main actress that essentially says that the movie's not about choosing color, it's about choosing love, that those two sides can create a beautiful thing. But you know what? Absolutely the fuck not. Not while people are fighting for basic bodily autonomy from one of those colors. Amongst a slew of other things, Absolutely not. They definitely make sure to have at least one super shitty character so he looks better by comparison, but make no mistake. Because this isn't a movie about people coming together and one person realizing some of the errors of their belief system, learning to stand up to the people around them that are saying a horribly racist shit. All that's just something they dance past for love. It is based on the book, but my act of self-care this week was not reading it. I did look up a synopsis though, just to see some of the differences. Instead of the Marines, the main guy Luke is in the army and it's set in Texas instead of California, which 
Makes sense. But apparently the main girl, Cassie, gets into a relationship while Luke is deployed and stays with that dude for most of the book. Which makes sense, it's a fake marriage, but it kind of puts their whole shtick at risk if like the world needs to believe they're in a relationship. I personally wish she had already been in a relationship before they did this whole fake marriage plan because that's the drama that I'm looking for. I should write one of these for the culture. But let's just hop right on into this one, send prayers. So we start with our two leads being set up. She is a struggling musician, bartender, writing songs in a seaside town, and he's a Marine, marining in a seaside town. For a minute, I thought her entire work life was being a musician, but this appears to be a cover band. Uh, but honestly, I would love that job. Please pay me money to obnoxiously sing in a bar. But apparently uh, they're actually just playing two cover songs because uh, their boss let them. And considering that is the scenario, I feel like this crowd is far too engaged. This is the type of bar where like the band playing is just what you're yelling over while you're talking to friends. But people are genuinely pissed off when he pulls the plug, which I don't get because her voice is a little irritating. Which I can't judge her for because my voice is also irritating. Either way, she gets back to serving drinks just in time for the Marines to walk in. And honestly, I too can relate to being annoyed when any group of military or military adjacent personnel walks into your place of employment. And I'm Canadian. But apparently she knows one of these Marines. She used to be his babysitter. Adorable. And while she openly hates them when she finds out they're deploying in a couple weeks, she offers them a free first round. What do you guys want to drink? First one's on the house. I'll have a Coke. Mm. So we're good enough to fight for your ass, but not good enough to touch it. Out! Out of the bar now! That is a very good way to have your ass tossed out of the bar or have your drinks tossed on you. But she just like storms off. But Coca-Cola Luke here decides to sort things out and apologize by saying that they're just blowing off some steam. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that blowing off some steam because you're deploying in a few weeks meant it was okay for you to complain that the bartender wouldn't let you touch your ass. Let me take some notes. So they go back and forth and he calls her this like predictable liberal whose parents probably bought her a Lexus and she's rich and she'll complain about wanting rights but not actually fight for them. And in an enemies to lover, that's basically foreplay right there. But I'm sorry, what rights are you fighting for Americans to have in Iraq in 2022? <laughs> But while they're flirting, uh, the soldier that looks like a toddler tells the gay bartender that she should stop being gay and give him a chance so she can get great health insurance. First off, ew, but I'm guessing they're gonna get married for medical reasons. Yeah, yeah, Cassie has diabetes. That, that was pretty instant. If you're unaware, insulin in America is criminally overpriced for being a life or death medication. It's quite horrific, so that is a fairly strong health incentive. But it's not something that immediately sparks in her mind. They make sure to show us that like her prescription can't be refilled as much as she needs it to be because the insurance hasn't renewed and she doesn't have the 500 plus dollars to buy it out of pocket, which is just disgusting. And because she's always trying to make sure she stays ahead on her insulin so you know she can stay ahead on being alive, she's behind on rent while working three different jobs. So things just aren't great. Though her mom has given her the option to move home. I know that would suck if it wasn't your choice, but if you have a good relationship with your mom, which she seems to, it's an easy way to get above water. I realize I say that while I'm sitting in my parents' home, but that is because the air in my apartment is being purified of drywall dust. But a real breaking point comes when her band is playing a show and she has to stumble off stage to get her insulin and happens to see a Marine sticker on the bathroom wall so a plan is formed. But it turns out the military guy isn't as perfect as he may seem. He's getting chased down by this degenerate and a big old Dodge Ram who I really feel would be able to afford this truck. Like you find out he's a drug dealer but he's not really giving me like top drug dealer level vibes. He's giving me the impression that he's like this sketchy guy who spends more time trying to track down money to pay off the debts of getting high off his own supply. They also pulled off the Dodge Ram logo from the front and I can't tell if it's because they couldn't get the rights from Dodge or if it's because they're trying to say, see, it's fine. His really expensive truck isn't that nice. But he's quite literally trying to run Luke over as a joke because Luke owes Jono 15 grand. And I'm sure that you didn't even hear me say 15 grand because his name is Jono. For why? Seems like Luke went a little bit off the deep end 
after his mom died of cancer and joining the Marines was his way of uh, cleaning up his life. Also right there, he's kind of throwing out that he didn't join the military for any altruistic reasons of trying to like fight for American rights. He did it to get his life back on track, which is fine. It's just like, don't be so high and mighty, mister. But once she formulates the plan, Cassie obviously doesn't go to douche canoe here. She hits up Frankie, the kids she used to babysit. Because not only do military spouses get great health benefits, Marines also get extra pay, separation pay, and a housing allowance that they could split. Win-win, except for the fact that he has a girlfriend. But gee, wow, douche canoe just happens to be at Frankie's house because they're bunkmates. Though as much as he needs money, he doesn't even jump right on the plan. He just points out that it's unethical and that it's fraud and they could be arrested. You'd be ripping off the government. I'd be ripping off the government. Oh my God, no, no, not the government. So that uh, tosses a wrench into the plan. But after seeing his nephew and talking to his brother and warning him about the debt he owes because he knows Jono could go at his family, he goes to bargain. Gives Jono what money has and decides, you know what, defrauding the government might not be the worst idea. But for some reason tells him the details of this plan. Like all he had to do was say he got clearance to do some kind of like higher paying, more dangerous job in the Marines so he'd be able to send more money. Once that money started coming in, Jono here doesn't exactly seem like the type that's gonna ask questions. So he meets up with Cassie to start working through the plan, calls her a liberal nut, really getting so much foreplay action here every time they meet up, and really stresses that they have to make a perfect plan so it's believable. They have to schedule times to talk, write romantic letters and emails, because if they get caught, they could both go to jail. But hey, at least if she gets sent to prison, they have to give her insulin. So honestly, a win-win for her. I'm obviously joking, that's horrific. So they get married, Frankie's there to be the witness and record it. He even hooks them up with the wedding ring he plans to use to propose to Riley when he gets back. Oh no, he's not getting back, is he? Shit. But to make sure that the rest of the troops think it's legit, because the last time they all saw each other was her uh, bitching him out, uh, she has to go out to have a meal with them, uh, which is fine until Asgrab speaks up again. To life, love, and hunting down some goddamn Arabs, baby! Oh my god, oh no, oh holy shit. Oh, they've literally only introduced this person so that Luke doesn't seem as bad. And the movie will absolutely not have the courage to just kill this asshole off. It's not like he's gonna learn a lesson. The movie's not about him. Even Frankie's like, come on, he's just stirring the pot. That is not stirring the pot. Especially not when you were literally going over to those countries with guns. And then. Luke has the audacity to get pissed off at her for saying something. I would have been like, you know what? Living with my mom ain't so bad, bye. But they both storm out and again, he's trying to make excuses. You know what he meant. Yeah, she definitely knows what he meant, but you don't. I don't think you understand what we're preparing ourselves to go and do. Oh no, oh my God, it's, tw what? it's 2022. And then they just have to hug it out for appearances. And then it's time to head over to the motel for the ritual pre-deployment banging. And oh no, they didn't give him a room with two beds like he asked. So they obviously start bickering again, but the second he admits that he's scared to be deployed the next day, they basically jump on each other immediately. Like literally all it took was this man admitting a little bit of vulnerability and they are all over each other, which I don't understand. Oh, they're actually gonna bang, that's abrupt. Even with my favorite enemies to lover pairing, uh, Bella and Rosalie. I would have needed that progression to take a bit more time. Seems like he regrets it a little bit the next day. I'm sure he wasn't some kind of like purity until marriage guy, but he does take love very seriously. She's taking it pretty hard considering I'm sure his mood has more to do with the fact that he's about to deploy out overseas, but all good. They head over to the base so she can get her ID and send them off. You see all the loving families, the people breaking down. They do their little kiss goodbye, but then a bunch of the guys hoist her up so they can have the last final passionate kiss and you can tell that they had some emotion behind this one. But she goes home and how does she let people know that she's proud of her military man? She hangs up an American flag. <laughs> Oh no, I sounded like a rooster. <laughs> also, don't worry guys, he's a good Marine. Look at him playing soccer with this kid. But they start writing to each other and giving themselves more background on who they are as people. And while she's narrating her letter, she's working on a song that seems to be a come home safe soldier song. Shit, fake married for a week and you're already writing your military wife songs? Woof, good shit. So they also start doing video calls and for some reason, none of them have headphones so they can just 
all hear each other's calls. That seems odd. Also, her hair is just all up in her sweater. Uh, and, and for some reason, they all want to hear the song that she's working on, but it's not ready yet. So while she heads off to finish working on that, things are getting a little bit serious in war. I know, I'm just as shocked as you. So when they talk the following week, people are kind of down because someone died. Everyone just really wants to talk to their families, but Luke wants to hear the song. We could all use that serenade. You did promise. No, I feel like the people outside just want to talk to their families? Like maybe they just want you to show the fuck up. Maybe they just want you to get off the phone? Just maybe? But of course not, they all love it, including this asshole. Many degrees of embarrassment experienced on my end, I, I definitely had to speed up the playtime. And while things are kind of falling apart on the military side, everything's going great for her. Apparently some promoter found a write-up about their band and put them on the bill for a music festival. But do people do uh, gig write-ups about cover bands and do those cover bands get invited to music festivals with one original song? He's stoked though. Wait, so does this mean that I'm like your muse? But it's time for the festival and I find it very funny that she's gone from all like anti-war to thanking the military people for their service. This song would do great on the radio though. It sounds like so much of what's already out there. So it's like perfect for those like fill in top 40s. But after all these new and exciting experiences start to pop up, she just can't get a hold of Luke and she just excitedly leaves him a message instead of realizing that Luke's probably hurt, which he was. An IED almost blew off his legs and he's being transferred to a medical center in San Diego. Problem being, she can't find the piece of paper with his brother's number on it. Here's a question though, why wouldn't you have programmed that into your cell phone? But she remembers that his name is Jacob, so she tracks him down on Google, but when she gets there, it's actually the dad. The one person that Luke wanted to make sure never found out he was in the military and definitely not that he was married. Now I assumed that he was gonna be so injured that he wouldn't be conscious enough to continue sending the money to Jono and that that was gonna be the conflict uh, right now, but no. Uh, he just wakes up, is told the skin graft worked, and suddenly his whole family just filters in. And his dad is a dick, just immediately starts grilling him about lying to him again because he never told him he joined the Marines. Yes, let's absolutely start verbally shitting on the person who just woke up from major surgery. But hey, at least he's gonna get a purple heart. Let's hope he gets full function of his legs back. But they leave him and Cassie alone to talk and Luke is pissed. His dad went on to be a military police and even though he's retired now, Luke is pretty sure his dad would turn them in in a heartbeat if he found out. So they really need to make the marriage look good and live together while he's going through physical therapy. I think you're gonna laugh or cry when he finds out about this. Shh. Oh no, not Frankie. I knew he wasn't gonna make it back. Well, that sucks. Why couldn't it be this fuck stick? Oh yeah, because no one would have cared. Oh, thank God she's giving Riley the ring and letting her know he planned to propose. I thought she was gonna hold on to that thing. But they move in together up all three flights of stairs in a wheelchair and she starts writing another song. This one's about how she hates that she's saying all the things she never believed before. And I can't tell if it's like the cutesy romantic things or the pro-military things. Jury's still out on that one. But Jono, again, seriously, why that name? Uh, is gonna be an issue. Anytime he talks to Luke, he mentions the fake marriage, so Luke knows it's information he can use against him if he doesn't start paying up again. Though I don't understand why he stopped paying him. Do you like lose some of that like extra pay benefit if you get injured? Either way, uh, no money, so Jono starts threatening Cassie, who for some reason gets him a recovery dog. I thought it might've been like an impending PTSD and other mental stress dog, but no, then they say that it's for his like leg rehab. Don't worry, nothing happens to the dog. It just stays cute. But now they start getting into the psychoanalyzing stage. He says she won't ever date someone she actually likes because she'd have to let someone in and give up some control. But he knows all about needing control because if he's not this rigid with his life, he's flying down the highway naked. See, they're a cute couple until the inevitable fundamental human rights disagreements. But it does lead to some vulnerability. She ends up seeing his leg. He's worried about not being able to run again because one of his dreams is running marathons around the world. But one night while Cassie's out being a rock star, her mom calls. Her mom is panicked, so Luke rushes right over. Apparently someone tried to break into the mom's house and Cassie shows up immediately after. Luke goes to investigate and immediately gets a call from Jono saying that it was a message, pay up or I'm gonna work my way through every connection you have. Then once they get home, Cassie has another blood sugar incident. So it's a very stressful night for Luke here. And clearly a moment where he realizes how much he actually cares about her. And you're wondering, what's he gonna do about this situation he's gotten himself into? And the answer is jump the gun-wielding drug dealer with his walker. Ah! Ah! 
If you mess with that woman again, I will kill you. This is everything I owe you. We're done. My dude, if you had the money, why didn't you just pay him with it? Because obviously he's gonna retaliate now. And yeah, it's a fast retaliation before he can even get back to the apartment Cassie's pissed and packing. Apparently Jono went right to her mom, told her all about the fake marriage and how he was gonna turn them both in. Could have just given him his money, Luke. His name is Jono. He's clearly not a reasonable man. Now apparently the reason why he was in debt for so much money is that he had stolen a $50,000 car that his dad was working on for someone and instead of selling it like he planned, he totaled it. So his dad said he was gonna turn him in if he didn't pay him back. So Jono was the one who lent him the money and I guess 15K is what remains. So that's how Luke knows that his dad would probably turn them in for the sham wedding in a heartbeat. Now Cassie's obviously pissed that Luke wasn't honest with her and has now put her and her mother in danger. So she heads off for an out-of-town gig and tells him to be out of the apartment by tomorrow. So he decides to go for a run, which absolutely would have set his rehab back so far. The man is still using a walker and limping and we're supposed to believe that he can run? But somehow he does it and he feels great and triumphant until he gets picked up by the military. Oh no, the pupper dumper's going be all alone. See, I'm uh, guessing that Jono didn't wait to go up the chain of command with that info. All you had to do was give him the money, man. But while Luke's life is collapsing again on Cassie's side, things are going great. They get a record deal and a spot opening for Florence in the machine. Okay, that's not even remotely similar music. Let's be realistic here. But she wakes up to a call from Luke's dad saying that he's been detained for fraud and asks her if it was all an act. No, not, not all of it. Ma'am, just say no! Just have a unified lie here for the self-preservation at least! So she rushes to the hearing and as obvious, Jono, whose real name is in fact Jonathan, turned them in and signed a sworn affidavit. We have a signed affidavit from Jonathan DeLuca's testimony. And I just can't see a world where a drug dealer would go anywhere near any type of authority, military or otherwise. Like this wasn't just some anonymous tip. But once the judge says that Cassie could be tried by the civilian courts in the US, Luke says that he coerced her into marrying him so she wouldn't get in trouble, but it instantly results in his guilty verdict. My dude, you could have lied. So when it's finally the day for him to be detained, he realizes that they still sent him the purple heart. I guess they don't take that away, even if you're found guilty of defrauding the government, which is probably good because he did not fraud nearly having his legs blown up. Wait, is the title implying that they were like both wounded by a war, that like now her heart is wounded when he was like physically wounded? Or am I thinking too hard? Or not enough? It's usually not enough. Okay, I looked it up. Uh, the lead actress asked the director if it was purple hearts as in her blue heart and his red heart coming together to make purple. I want Ah, but the director said she'd not thought of that, but yes, I guess that is essentially the heart of the story. The heart of my story is wanting to put my head through that wall. Maybe that was the book title's intention. But as he's about to be locked up, she's playing this new song on stage all about loving him. And instead of sticking around for what I assume was the Florence part of the concert, she drives all the way to the base and says, even if it started fake, they made vows to each other and followed them. They've taken care of each other in sickness and in health. So she'll wait the six months for him to get out. Honestly, this is the type of movie that could have gotten away with like your honor. It might have started fake, but like within a day, we were committed. I can't believe he's actually going to jail. This is incredible. But he gets out and she's gotten his name tattooed on her wedding finger. Oh my God. Oh no. And they live happily ever after, frolicking on the beach, never talking about politics, I have to assume. And that's the movie. It's so romantic. Look, we can do enemies to lovers, but I don't know if we can do fundamentally different belief systems to lovers. Also, for how long this movie is, there was really no time for them to build a believable relationship where they'd just be cool staying married. Like most of it's just filled with her performing the songs, but like they've never talked about kids. Kids get mentioned one time and she seems like scared to shit. So maybe she doesn't want kids. He sure seems to. They haven't breached that conversation. He never has a moment where he realizes that a lot of the stuff that he believes and says and allows to be said around him is wrong and she's just 
okay with that. We're just lacking some personal growth here. I'm just concerned that the fictional couple hasn't thought through their sham wedding hard enough. Also, this guy didn't die, so zero out of 10. But yeah, that's the movie. I can definitely see why a lot of people like it and why a lot of people think it's cute, uh, even though I hate the core apprentice. If you enjoyed it, that's okay. So thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members with a special thanks to my latest Jedi Knight level patron, Allison O. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. All my social medias will be linked down below. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.